Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast, the first podcast of 2022. And as usual, usual is the correct term, right, uh, Austin? I'm joined in that right seat there, the co-pilot seat by Austin Ward. I know him as awesome, but I go by his uh, God-given name, Austin. Uh, once again, man, here we are in 2022. 2022. That's easy for me to say. And welcome to the Tim May Podcast, my man. And uh, feels like we were just celebrating the, the new year in Southern California. And what a what a way to kick it off for Ohio State and a crazy game and uh, some kick confetti around us as we shot that video on Saturday night. And you decided to stay in a different time zone. But yeah. I have but I have made it back. Yeah, you did make it back without any cancellation or uh, any, any otherwise any like a 20 minute delay. That's pretty good compared to some people still, I guess, waiting for a flight back. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I digress. I won't give away our secret airline that you and I use for charter purposes. That's it. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually in Las Vegas right now. I'm getting ready to play golf here in a little while with a couple of buddies of mine, Tom Blattler, and uh, they're going to have to have dinner with Gary Long, my old time friend from the Miami Herald, who who was a guy who was always gambling, so he retired out here. I'm not sure that's a good move. Because <laughs> uh, I think based on – Based on his digs, I don't think he wins a lot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, gam- gambling and golf, where can I sign up for that? Yeah, it reminds me of horrible bosses, you know, where the guy was caught drag racing in a Prius, and he said, I don't win much. <laughs> 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 That's one of the great Ron White. Uh, no. Anyway, I digress. Uh, yeah, the Rose Bowl, wow. Uh, what a way for Ohio State to finish and start. <laughs> All at the same time, gentlemen, uh, start your engines for 2022. Uh, You know, Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, perhaps a a rising star at linebacker in Cade Stover, who seemed to get better as that game went on. Uh, Yeah, right on down the line. I mean, uh, some guys just played really well in that game who are going to be coming back. And, you know, uh, even Amika Egbuka, great kickoff returns, a couple of three catches. Uh, Julian Fleming was banged up, but he still played hard, according to Brian Hartline. I mean, you know, the, as you and I joked about after that game, somebody said, you know, they were, uh, uh, boy, they got a reloaded wide receiver for 2022. And I said, they just did. You know, what <laughs> what game were you watching? And uh, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, you know, tough to see them not play in what could have been their final college game. But uh, the beat moves on in the Ohio State receiver room, zone six. It's, it's really never been stronger, has it? No, and it's it's pretty – I mean, I'm running out of ways to describe it. Yeah. I, think, I think at some point that uh, it would have to come to an end, that you can't maintain this forever. But, you know, the recruiting – people are just lining up. The best receivers in the country want to play for Brian Hartline, and he has had a, a knack for getting them to buy into how this works. That, um, yes, Marvin Harrison earlier in the year could have played more anywhere else. Emeka Ibuka. Same deal. Even Jaden Bauer, who didn't even get the same opportunities that those two did, uh, is a top, you know, couple hundred recruit, depending on which service you're going to look at. The, and those guys are coming on. That's with Julian Fleming still fighting there, a class above them, is the number one overall wide receiver in the country in his class. Uh, made some plays and then had it, the other shoulder now, not the one that had been worked on, gets hurt briefly in that game and straps yeah. up that harness and, and keeps going. You could Because t- he knows, like, you can't give up a spot in this wide receivers room because it could be that easy to get past. And, and the next guy will be right there waiting for the opportunity to catch a bunch of footballs and, and touchdowns as Marvin Harrison did Marvin Harrison jr. Did on Saturday night. So um, that's all crazy. And um, Jackson Smith and Jig was the ring leader of that unit. That's something you wrote about right leading up to the game. Pretty timely. Um, so the performance he had against, Utah was one for the ages and it's one that I was kind of joking about this during the game like Jackson just won next year's Bolitnikov trophy because that's sort of how the sausage gets made on these award votes Um, that case uh, he made in that game is going to stick with people it's not supposed to count for 2022 even though uh, it was in 2022 uh, January 1 Uh, no one's going to forget what he did when they're not watching every single game next season I haven't seen the exact ratings, but I'm going to guess that the Rose Bowl had the largest of any postseason game. And what they saw was Jackson Smith and Jigba, the reload of the Ohio State wide receivers room, 
and C.J. Stroud make his case that villain mode can lead him to the Heisman Trophy next year. Absolutely. You may have, you know, uh, you know, Bryce Young, we'll see how he uh, finishes out in the national championship game against uh, against Georgia coming up on Monday uh, from Indianapolis. You know, wow. Well, uh, like I said, Bill Bender, I've got Bill Bender on this uh, podcast too later. And uh, uh, like I said, man, they should have just said, you know what, let's save all the money and everybody bust to, bust to, uh, to, to uh, Atlanta and get this done, you know, uh, SEC championship game part, duh. Uh, but it is interesting the way that game went in the Rose Bowl because without, without those heroics from C.J. Stroud, the, the biggest passing day yardage-wise in Ohio State history, tied for the most touchdown passes in one game in Ohio State history, which he's done what, what he, which he did this past season, what, three times? Am I right? Six touchdown passes? I mean, that's, that's nutty. But without all of that, they don't beat Utah – because Utah got out to a 35-21 lead, and uh, thank goodness the, the the Big Ten defense came out in the, uh, the Big Ten Ohio State defense came out in the second half, urged on by Demario McCall of all people giving a uh, uh, giving a, an impassioned speech there at halftime, while another of his teammates was on Twitter doing all he could to derail some things. That was crazy. I'm not even gonna get into that, but just the two of those guys, uh, the one guy stuck it out and did become a factor, you know, in the, in his, in his final game. I think it's his final game. Is that Demario's final game? What do you yeah. think? Yeah. yeah. Six years later. I don't know how that all works, you know, with the, with the COVID thing, I lose track and stuff, but it is crazy, man. He, he stayed loyal and w- was a factor in that team coming back. I mean, from an inspirational standpoint, but without a doubt, uh, as Ryan Day said, the defense playing with more violence in the second half was definitely the difference. I mean, they went out there, gave up only 10 points, and that one touchdown was to the backup quarterback after the starter for uh, Utah got hurt, Cam Rising. Uh, but uh, but the bottom line, that was such an inspirational game to watch, to cover, uh, to be around, to be a part of, really. Uh, I think you agree with me, don't you? Yeah, it was great. And, you know, I, you can look at that game and see the part – Ohio State was not matching the same urgency, intensity. They did not care as much at kickoff. And I, and I think I, I got that vibe during pregame as much as it meant to Utah. And a huge traveling contingent there. This was their uh, – I mean, obviously it was a Rose Bowl, but this was their Super Bowl to use yes. that. Okay, how much they cared about being there for the first time as the Pac-12 champion, playing Ohio State, uh, all, of the, all the trappings that go along with that. They wanted that more. And at the start of the game, that was clear. I think Ohio State, the motivational part, they until they got smacked in the face, not just once, but two, three, four, or five times in the first half, and they like, wait a minute. Um, then the pride kicked in. And the more talented team, even with missing 25, you know, plus players when you added in the ejection and Lathan Ransom's leg injury and all the other things, like they, they were shorthanded, but uh, the players they had, once they realized and once their pride got challenged, it could have gone a different way. They could be like, ah, let's use these excuses and let's let's tap the helmets and and head home. That didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, as you said, Demario McCall was part of that. Several other guys at, at halftime changing the course, uh, choosing to uh, defend their honor and represent Ohio State and themselves and the names on the back of the jersey. Um, you know, that's what you call that inspirational. I, I think it's significant because it would have been very easy for them to lose that game and for us to point to all the issues that they were facing and that it doesn't change – the win or lose didn't change that they lost to Michigan, didn't change they lost to Oregon, that those were the defining memories of that season. Um, and for me, I still feel that way, even though the Rose Bowl was just a separate deal. Yeah. And I think it does have meaning – it's separate from what happened in 2021 with not winning the Big Ten and losing in, in the rivalry game to Michigan. Um, the changes that they had to make, Jim Knowles, like all that stuff is the same. What happened in the Rose Bowl doesn't alter the 2021 season. Yeah. But, but it does show that heading into 2022 that this team cares a lot about uh, playing for the, each other, playing for the school, getting back to winning championships, um, testing their resolve, having young players get reps 
in a big time setting with, as I said, a ton of people watching in the stadium and on TV, that part does matter. Even if it doesn't, you know, you can't separate them and, and have both mean, mean something. And I think that Ohio state did find uh, a lot of value in that, the way that they responded in the second half. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I told you Austin was jacked about the Rose Bowl, man. You couldn't help me. And you know what's funny? It, it would have been interesting to get some real close-ups of Cal Whittingham, the Utah coach, who had to be standing on the sidelines. I mean, I, you know, I saw the up-close shots of him, uh, et cetera. But at times he had to be going, wait a minute. They're missing all these guys, and they're still that damn good? You know what yeah. I mean? And it – it kind of reinforces what we were talking about all year. You know, you, me, Jeremy Birmingham, Spitzer Holbrook. People thought we were gushing too much about their depth. Oh, my goodness. Their depth went to another level, in my opinion, in that game. I mean, or at least the uh, examples of it. And yeah. crazy defensive line. I mean, Teron Vincent played probably the best game of his college career in that game. Defensive tackle. Yeah, they got – kind of like shoved around and kind of bamboozled in the first half, but they definitely tightened it up in the second half. Jerron Cage, uh, Tyleek Williams, those guys kind of stepped up. I mean, uh, they had to do something to keep Utah from going up and down the field. Utah still gained a few yards in the second half, but the defense, you know, basically came to the fore when it came to the most important stat, which was points allowed. And uh, it was it was crazy to watch guys with that – with that basically that pack on their back deliver, wasn't it awesome? Yeah. And I think that, you know, that was part of the way I was approaching covering and analyzing the Rose bowl was that a lot of the individual performances were going to matter more to me yeah. moving forward than, than whether they won or lost. And everybody gets to, you know, evaluate and do it however they want. I have no problem with that. That was, you know, you, you, you joked about it. I didn't think that we were going to get a thrilling game like that. For one, that would uh, go down as an epic postseason game, no matter uh, how you count it uh, in the record books or for the championship race. So that part was incredibly fun to watch and, and far more enjoyable. But you still look at it, and I still take out the individual performances more than Utah putting up 45 points and, and all that stuff because you, you brought up uh, some very significant names there. Tommy Eichenberg, um, I thought had been pretty unfairly maligned over the last couple of months and that people had formed an opinion of him and they were ignoring the, the progress that he made. Is yep. he uh, a first round NFL draft pick at linebacker? No, but he's sort of like the next evolutionary tough Borland, another person who was beat up pretty good because he doesn't maybe check all the physical boxes, but he will stick his, his helmet in any hole uh, to go in there or fill any hole in any gap, rack up tackles. He was doing that progressively as the season went on and then capped it with 17 of them when he had to play a ton of snaps uh, against Utah in the Rose Bowl. Yeah, That's one that I pull out and say, you need, you got a game that you have to stop the run. You know Tommy Eichenberg can do that. Shades um, of shades of Chris Spielman in the 1985 Rose Bowl. Same mm -hmm. kind of game. Chris Spielman was a freshman, but, you know, huge tackles. Chris Carter – you know, huge catches. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, sometimes guys just come along, man. <laughs> yeah. And you have to like be acknowledge patient. it. And that way you acknowledge it. And you recognize that it wasn't going to happen all at once with all these guys. This was the culmination now for Tommy Eichenberger. His first year in the lineup lineup court Williams um, played a heck of a ball game. Uh, you can tell that there was still some rust that was being fought off, but the physical part, the way he moved, the way he was diagnosing some plays and getting to the football, you can tell that he's over what was happening um, from the injury as a true freshman and then slowly acclimating into the lineup as the year went on. Yeah. You know that he's going to play a big role. That Individually, you pull that one out and say, okay, here's another guy that you can count on. Cade Stover that you talked about with six tackles when five weeks ago he was at tight end. Um, that's a dude now. He wants to hit people. He looks so much more like a linebacker than a he, tight end. I mean, it's crazy, right? I think we can just say he is a linebacker. Like, that's, yeah. you know, he could play tight end. Um, and if Ohio State needed him to uh, down the road, he would. But I think that's you, – you found out something else about him, and that's that he can really help that defense. And, and I think you just – that to me is – 
emblematic of what I take from it. Like the linebackers did not meet the standard this season. They, there wasn't going to be a tremendous amount of change in the scheme because Jim Knowles didn't get to spend the last month working with them. The staff was the same. The, the roster was even more shorthanded uh, going into this game. So, but the fact that you come out of it and you say, well, okay, now you have Steel Chambers with another offseason, Tommy Eichenberg with another offseason and a great performance to build some uh, personal momentum. Cade Stover stamping a flag at linebacker. Cody Simon was on the sideline. You know that once he gets that shoulder right, it bothered him at the end of the year. You put him back in the mix. Mitchell Melton is standing there on the sideline. He's going to be healthy for spring ball, I assume. Um, the Diamante Trainum coming in, ready to make that same move. Yeah. Uh, two of the top, you know, two five-star talents who could help at linebacker um, with Styles and Hicks. Now suddenly you're looking at, and if you're like, you're not a 45 points, okay, you don't want to see that again. All right, well, this is the group that can make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of excitement. That's just that one position. But I think that's what I mean for this game with 48-45 is not what Ohio State wants to play all the time. But narrow down to, to what you see individually, boy, there's guys that, that have reason to be excited about this offseason. I was going to say, man, you know, that's what I wanted to get into because I've got a, you know, another, another special guest making his third appearance on the Tim May podcast, Marlon Kerner, former cornerback at Ohio State, former cornerback in the NFL. You know, his assignment, I gave him an assignment in the middle of that game. Hey, watch what's going on here, man. And this is when they were getting their butt kicked. You know, tell me what you would change or tell me what you think Jim Knowles is going to change immediately. Or just give me some insight on what's coming. And, uh, you know, let's get to my conversation with him uh, to begin with here. Uh, because, uh, Austin, because, you know, it just – these ex-players, man, they ran the gamut on on Saturday night from, oh, my gosh, you know, maybe yeah. putting their Ohio State stuff in the back corner – to like putting it on proudly at the end of the game. I mean, you know, Marlon, it kind of addresses that just about the pride you felt after that game was over, that that's, that's the school you used to play for. Yes, that's what sets Ohio State apart to a lot of programs. The heart, man, I'm pointing at my, my uh, I'm pointing at my throat because if I point my heart, you can't see it. Uh, but <laughs> your heart's heart, in your throat, Tim. Yes, exactly. The heart is what separates some of these big time programs from the others, man. And Ryan, they even addressed that when you and I and, and Dave Holmes were talking to him after the game in that tunnel, man. That's not to be discounted now, right? Yep, absolutely. Well, anyway, let's get to my conversation with Marlon Kerner. Well, this is the encore after the encore appearance by Marlon Kerner on the Tim May podcast. Marlon, former Ohio State Buckeye cornerback, former uh, NFL cornerback. Welcome back to the Tim May podcast. Thank you for having me. And finally, I get to come on the show and it's not after a Buckeye loss. So yeah, I'm very happy and excited about this conversation we're going to have today. But I will tell you, when we were when we were hook, hooking up and texting about you coming on, uh, they were getting their, their butt handed to them in the first half of that game in the Rose Bowl. And, uh, and it, I wasn't just getting you because of bare bad news. I just wanted to get you for exactly what we're going to talk about is, you know, you've seen a whole season of this team. I know you've paid attention. Uh, maybe not every play of every game, but uh, definitely the Rose Bowl. And, uh, they, you know, they got some things straightened out between the first half and the second half. Is for one of the term, uh, you know, Ryan Day said the defense came back out in the second half and just played more violent. You know, just if yeah. nothing else, just hit the guy in front of you, you know, make something happen. And it paid off. They only gave up 10 points. And uh, – one of the great games in Ohio State history ensued. I, uh, that was a thrilling game to watch. You, as a former player, I think you agree, right? Absolutely. It was one of those games where I'm, I'm, I was watching it. Like I don't know which version of the Ohio State team shows up, right? Because you're so close, you know. And the expectations for this program is to be playing for a national championship every year. So you've got this long layover. You're like, all right, now what's going to happen? What do they look like? And they come out and they're down 14 nothing quickly. I'm like, ooh, this is getting really ugly fast. Uh, and it was always the same thing. Can we stop the run? Can we tackle well? Can we disrupt what they're doing? And in the first half, it looked bleak. I was sitting there like, wow, this is about to be really ugly. I think I text you like, yeah, tackling like, oh, my gosh. Like, I mean, wrap up. Like, the quarterback pops 65-yard touchdown run because one guy wraps him, one guy hits him in the back, and he spins out. I'm like, Hello, <laughs> like, can you just secure the tackle and everyone else jump and pile on and strip the ball? But it, it looked like whatever was said at halftime, their mindset 
their body language, their attitude. Um, they were definitely two separate teams from the first half and the second half. And, and it showed on defense. Like, you know, they talked about being violent with their hands. I, I would say they were more aggressive. And yeah. I think the thing that I watched from Ohio State all year long was their slowness to di- diagnose and digest what was happening in front of them. Like they would see it. And then it was almost like a three count, like, okay, the guards pulling one, two, three. Okay. I got to go here now. Um, and it just took long for them to really diagnose and just say, I got to go play, but they just played faster. They played downhill and they started making plays. And, and sometimes when you have adversity go against you, you kind of play too shit to play it safe. But they didn't play it safe. They just went after it. And if they made a good play, great. If they made a bad play, we're going to line up play the next one. And that helped really big time to turn it around. And the offense was just clicking. I mean, from that, from that, once CJ started throwing dime, like, yep, this offense is clicking. We just need our defenses to just make some stops. Yeah. Downfield, man. That was the key. I was sitting next to Dave Holmes from uh, Channel 10, you know, in Columbus. And uh, I said, man, this sideways stuff. I mean, throw the ball downfield. They're – there are guys wide open. They, they, you know, their secondary was quite challenged. I'm talking about Utah's secondary. They had one good cornerback, really, in that Clark Phillips kid who had the interception in the end zone, by the way. Uh, you know, that's a touchdown that was taken away from Ohio State. And then Jackson Smith and Jigba fumbled the ball away into the end zone after a great run and catch. You know, that's literally two more touchdowns that Ohio State could have had in this game. It was crazy how many, you know, 683 total yards or something. It was crazy. But, but, uh, you know, those other guys were fair to Midland back there in the defensive secondary for Utah. And like you said, Ohio State attacked downfield and it totally changed everything. Agreed? Agreed. I mean, and I think that's what you want. And hopefully that's what you, the offense looks like next season. Like you see what Jackson can do in the slot. And then you start looking at Marvin Harrison Jr. And, and the host of other guys that they had that the young bodies, because that's what the question was, okay, we lost Alave, uh, we lost Garrett Wilson, they're not going to play. What does this offense look like? Oh, my gosh, like, we're just going to turn the hand the ball off to Henderson. And, and he really couldn't get going. Like, Utah is stout up front. You know, they're pretty good against run anyway. I think they only gave up, like, 3.5, 3.8 yards to carry anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it was going to be tough sledding to really move the ball, run the ball consistently against them. So you had to pass in a depleted secondary. And I thought the scheme and the game plan of how they attacked them was perfect because you spread them out. And the same thing that we talk about our offense and our linebackers not being able to do, which is being able to match up and do those things. They did those very, very, very well. Um, and I was just like, wow, this is amazing. I hope we continue this. But uh, our, for everybody who said that C.J. Stroud is not the quarterback and, uh, and we're worried about this, he showed why he should be the quarterback going forward. I mean, he was throwing so accurately. He put balls in places that you didn't see – him through all season long, like his growth from game one to the end of this bowl game and the end of the season was amazing. And I'm so looking forward to what he's going to do. Heisman front runner already uh, with Jackson. You already got two Heisman candidates already um, that are going to be named come next season. But it was an amazing performance. 15 catches, what, 347, three touchdowns. Amazing, amazing performance from a wide receiver and 573 from CJ. Just amazing performance by both of them. Yeah, I think uh, Jack Smith and Jigba, I forgot the exact yardage, but half of it came after the catch. I mean. Amazing. He was catching the ball, and he was off hands. <laughs> like, you know, I was looking like, man, the way he put some balls on him, it just he put it and dropped it in the perfect spot and all hands. And there was no bobble. There was nothing. It was just pop, catch, strong hands at the point of attack um, and catching the ball and then getting two feet down. Like, yeah, it, it, was, it was fun to watch what this offense could possibly look like next year. Yeah, I mean, uh, I love Jackson, too. He's from Rockwall, Texas. And, uh, you know, he, he and I are always joking. I'm from Lufkin, Texas, uh, from way back when and stuff. But uh, I told him that famous story. Uh, I was going down visiting Texas a lot when my mom was uh, in the final days, final months of her life. And I'm, I'm getting gas just north of Lufkin, and there's a guy sitting there with a car, and it's got it's – got, license plates but you know around the around the license plates is something Rockwall, texas you know and i just said jackson smith and jigba just shouted it across the uh filling station and the guy goes great player great great player <laughs> and i went yeah so uh i think i think everybody knows about jack smith and jigba he had well he forget about his season he had one of the great second halves to a season in history, I mean, like 60 catches in, I think, the last five games or something for 
you know, more than half of his yards. I mean, crazy what he did. Crazy what he did. Here's what I want to ask you, though. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, you remember a guy named Marvin Harrison? I do remember a guy named Marvin Harrison. Yes. Did you ever cover him? I did. Yes. <laughs> do, how much does his son, Marvin Harrison Jr., does he remind you of him at all? He reminds me a lot of him. The way he was patient at the line with the shake, very quick. Um, definitely a lot taller, a little taller than his dad. Yeah. Um, definitely like Marvin Harrison was so quick in and out of his breaks. Um, and the way he could get off the bump and press coverage and line of scrimmage. Um, I was looking at what he did against some of those secondary guys um, from Utah last yesterday. And I was like, okay, yeah, a lot like his dad. Um, it's going to be fun to watch. Like, again, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things you like, all right, we're, we've got two guys that, probably arguably the best one of the top duos that ever come out of a house of history and they're not going to play and you're like what does this passing attack looks like and they only go out and put up almost 600 yards of passing um marvin harrison jr catches three touchdown passes yeah <laughs> jackson catches three touchdown passes and everyone else is just making plays i'm like i'm so excited about what's going to happen uh brian hartline has done an amazing job of getting everyone ready um and and i i, I tip my hat to Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave were still being there and, and showing support of the sideline, even though they decided not to play in this game. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, make a Buka number 12, you know, the guy that was kickoff yeah. return, but he had like three catches. I mean, that guy, that guy's got big time written all over him too. I mean, and Julian yeah. Fleming, number four, you know, all three of those guys were depending on where you looked, recruiting rankings were the top receiving uh, one of the top receivers in their recruiting classes, you know, in various forms and stuff. And you're right. I mean, people keep, you know, I was on a TV uh, interview uh, for Sunday uh, on Channel 10 and Dom Tiberi, you know, Dom Tiberi. Dom. And he says, well, they're going to reload. I go, Dom, I said, I don't know if you were paying attention or not. They they reloaded. I mean, they, you know, you can't play a whole lot better than uh, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. did in a first start for the Buckeyes. That was that was cool to watch, wasn't it? It was. It was it was it was almost like watching hockey. It was like. Yeah. Yes, have three guys, and it was like line change, change it up. Here we go, and you could just roll in a platoon. You literally could platoon in those guys, and it would be interesting to see if they had done that this year. What it would have looked like. Yes, um, definitely. You have a, a whole second line of guys ready to come in and contribute, and when they got their opportunities, they did not squander them at all. Like they really made all the tough catches that came their way. Uh, it was fun to watch, and I'm really excited about what the secondary or what the receiver group is going to look like going forward. Because there's a lot of talent and more talent coming in, which is crazy. Yeah. Like I don't know how they get that talent there and get them to stay in an era where you have the portal. Like, hey, I'm not getting my chance. I'm going to go ahead and go somewhere else and get another opportunity. And those guys are like, nope, I'm staying. And now they're shining. Like we're going to step up, and they're going to be the guys that are going to be looking to be leaders for this next class coming in, which is amazing. You know what? You know what stood out. You just said that, and it peaked a uh, a thought in my brain. What stands out is when you do get your shot, it looks like there's going to be a pretty good quarterback throwing the ball to you in the in the Ryan Day era, yes. and uh, it, you know catch the ball and you're going to go places. You know that's Absolutely. I catch mean the ball. that's it. He's yeah. gonna, he's going to put it on you because. I mean, 71 point, what, 71.8, 71.7% completion yeah. percentage for the entire season. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. He's putting the ball in the right places and making it very easy to catch. So, as a receiver, that's a dream. You, like, just throw me the ball, put it in a place I can catch it, and I'll do my thing afterwards. All right. Speaking of doing your thing, and uh, we got way off course there because that is what stood out the other night was watching that uh, offense uh, and watching the defense second half. But, as you know, Jim Knowles, uh, was introduced or basically formally took over as a defensive coordinator on Sunday on uh, January the 2nd. Matt Barnes, who ended up assuming the, the uh, set calling duties for Ohio State on defense after the second game this year, is moving on to become the defensive coordinator at Memphis. You know, good for him, right? Yeah, um, for him. There, there might be one or two more changes on the defensive staff, although Ryan Day hasn't announced them as you and I record this and might not, you know, for a few days. But I wanted to ask, you know, uh, Marlon, if you could be in Jim Knowles' ear, uh, the new defense coordinator coming from Oklahoma State, who turned that defense around from a, 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 what you'd call a regular Big 12 defense into a, uh, a real defense uh, in a span of three years. I don't know, what, what would you whisper to him or what do you expect him what, – what's the first thing you expect him to do from a scheme standpoint that, that's going to make a difference? And how much of a difference – does the scheme make in the, in the long run? I think scheme makes a big difference, but you have to have the right players 
to play the scheme you want. And so yeah. um, really good coaches will come in and evaluate and say, this is what we have currently. This is what we need to get to run the scheme that I want. And I think that's why you saw the progression of what he was able to do at Oklahoma State was he got there. I don't have the players to run what I have, but we're going to start building a foundation and getting these guys to understand it. It, and then I'm going to recruit and get people to come here that can do what I envision this defense can look like. Now, with that being said, Ohio State does have a lot of talent. Um, and we, you and I talked off camera about what the defense front's going to look like and the moving around um, of the, the D-line position that he loves to have. But I'll talk about the secondary piece because what you're going to see um, when you look at the stats, what his defense did last year, they were first in tackles for loss, right? They were what, fifth and – run defense, third and total defense, first and sack. So that front gets after it. Yeah. But what he does do very well um, is he uses a three safety type of scheme. So you're not going to have a linebacker kind of mismatch and out of place out of that four, two, five defense. He'll keep the scheme the same. We run that. So it already makes sense to go get somebody who does that and does it at a high level. So you get the best guy at it. You bring him in. What he'll do is he'll put the right bodies to match up. Because what you saw when we played Alabama um, and sometimes Clemson is, is we would stay in that package because that's what we wanted to run in case they want to try to run the ball at us. But then you get mismatches in the passing game. And so you might get a linebacker on a very fast wide receiver that's third or in a trip position. And so that, that's a mismatch. And if yeah. you can protect and you can't get the pressure, which we didn't get, that's a touchdown all day. What you're going to see from him is he's going to bring those safeties. Their safeties are going to move around. So the safeties that we have should be licking their chops. The safeties that are coming in, she's like, I'm going to love playing in his defense because you're going to love matching up. He's going to create the right people, have them all move around. They can all go down and cover tight ends, slot receivers. They can go back and get in the second, get in the safety positions, free safety or strong safety. They can force the run. So you're going to see a lot of that movement for matchup purposes. But I think the biggest thing that you'll see is aggressiveness. His defenses are known to be aggressive. They're going to come at you from all different angles. They're sound on their defense. That's why they led the nation in tackles for losses because they bring pressure from all different angles. They're going to find a mismatch and then exploit it and bring it. And then the safeties were so smart. Um, and that's where you talk about the maybe just kind of figuring out how to run the scheme is they, they diagnose everything very quickly and they get to where they're supposed to be. They're sound in their run, their runs, their run defense and holding and containing their gaps. And they get a lot of pressure. So I'm excited about what it's going to look like. But the onus is going to be on the safeties moving around a lot and being able to make those adjustments and being able to play some man to man. And that means the corners are going to have to hold up because they're going to play some man to man, <laughs> a lot of man to man. So Denzel Burke and the crew, they should be looking for like, hey, man, we're going to play a lot of man to man to showcase our skills. And if you can do that at a high level, that means the front seven is going to get after it. It's going to be a lot of fun next year watching this defense. Hey, you know, the way he likes to stand up that – what he calls that Leo position, basically a defensive end, but he moves him around and stuff. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure he's a – you'd call him a defensive end because a lot of times he's between the – you know, it's, it's almost like they're in three down linemen and he got this extra guy just kind of floating around trying to figure out where he wants to go launch from, <laughs> you know. Uh, but oh, are you intrigued by that? Do you, do you see that? Playing well in the Big Ten, I mean that kind of like approach from a from a deep from a defensive front guy. I, I think he'll ha he'll have some some packages where he'll put that in there, some passing situations. I think he'll understand like in the Big Ten, they're going to try to run some power game, kind of like Utah did. So I don't think yeah. he might not use it as much against Utah with that um, twelve personnel, thirteen personnel they were running, just kind of coming in like, here we go, we're going to pound it, we're going to bring a lot of pressure. So. I think he knows when to bring it, but in passing situations, it's going to be a lot of fun because yes. if you can get the, the normal three down linemen to get pressure and then you're moving guys and you're bringing linebackers and you're bringing safeties from different angles, it makes it very difficult to kind of figure out how you're going to protect. That means you got to figure out where the Leo is at all time. You're going to slide your protection there, especially if that Leo is really good at bending the end, bending the edge and kind of getting past tackles um, and, and then getting on backs. Um, or if you can get him on the tight end one on one, um, then that that's a lot <laughs> easier for a defensive end to kind of, hey, I'm a, I, I like that matchup a lot. Um, yeah. So if he can kind of create some of those mismatches, I think it's going to be great. But I think you'll see some of that traditional front front that Ohio State also employs out of that kind of like, hey, listen, we got to stop the run because you do Michigan's going to try well. We'll say that – well, I can say Michigan right now because we're in January. Um, so, it, it, once once we get past this conversation, then I'll say that team up north. Okay. Um, yeah. That team up north is going to run the ball. Michigan State's going to run the ball. Um, Wisconsin's going to run the ball. Iowa's going to – like, we run the ball here. Um, so, yeah. it's going to be fun to watch. But it also 
you put him in different place, excuse me, you'll put that Leo in different place. So if he's quick, um, he can kind of help some of those pull. If you like to run some counter trades and things that, hey, he, he can get down there uh, kind of like a guy like Jadavian Clowney could get, kind of get those mismatches. They would move him all over the place. That kind of reminds me of what it would look like. Um, yes. And they were stout. Like that South Carolina defense when he was there, they were they were stout. They would they could fly around because you could move <clears> him on <throat> one side, put him on the other side, put him on a nose tackle. It creates mismatches. And then you have to figure out how you're going to slide it, which then means there's one-on-one for other guys to exploit. And then you can bring your linebackers off edges and bring them in gaps as well, which then causes some other issues for, for how you're going to block it and defend it. And you can get some mismatches. So they might turn it loose and let, it, let him on the back. <laughs> I would love to see – my Leo get one on one with a back. I, I would take that that matchup all day as well. You know what bothers me about you, Marlon? You haven't thought much about this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what kind of job? Just a couple of the quickies, man. What kind of job did Ryan Day do in the final analysis for the twenty twenty one season, which capped with a ridiculous Rose Bowl victory, one of the great games, thrilling games I've ever covered in my life. I mean, like I said. If I had been, you know, anywhere else, I would have tuned in just like I watched that Purdue Tennessee game the other day, you know, and that Music City Bowl. It just, like I said in the second quarter, matter of fact, you responded at one point to me when I tweeted this, uh, but I don't think you were responding to that. But I said, it's like the Music City Bowl is broken out here in the Rose Bowl. It was like we're going up and down the field and it was nuts. But, uh, you know, th- there, was, there was evidence in the second half of, a, of heart for this Ohio State football team of pride and really of ability finally too. And I would think as a former player, you know, as bad as things did look in the first half and part of the second half, you got to be feeling pretty good about the way you watch these young men respond with their backs against the wall and in the corner, right? I mean, uh, go ahead. I mean, I was just impressed that they finally – it looked like, the defense kind of finally figured out how to play that scheme. And, yeah. and for whatever reason, um, it took a lot longer for them to just really recognize like, okay, they did this. I, I need to be here, shoot it, run it, beat, beat the man to a spot and get there. And they did that um, in the second half It's particularly like that second half of the third quarter and the fourth quarter. Like they got stops on top of stops on top of stop. Like, Oh, okay. I'm loving what our defense is doing. Um, but it was just amazing. And then when you hear, Ryan Day say, you know, it was a player got up and talked and, and gave a speech because, you know, we always want to put the, you know, Ryan Day this and he's be fine, like firing them up and saying all these things like, listen, coaches, coach, players play. Yeah. And as a as a coach, Ryan Day put the best talent on the field. Now it's up to us to go make plays. Um, you know, we, we talk about that a lot. Of time. You know, former players talk about, look, we just got to make plays at the end of the day. Doesn't matter what they do. Like they might out scheme us and do some things. We got to figure it out the next time they try to run it because it will show up again. And then we got to make a play. It's all about performance. Can you make enough plays at the end of the day to win a game? We finally did. And it was fun to watch and just really fun to see them get confidence. I think as you saw them start making plays and getting stops, it was fun to watch them. Like they, they slowly gain confidence. And as I'm like, it's like a dad watching there's a young, young child just kind of like, Hey, they're figuring it out. They're taking the first steps. Now they're running. Now they're breaking world records and track meets and things like that. Like it was just fun to watch them finally just play free. Yeah. You know, and that's the one thing we talk about as defenders is you want to play fast. You want to play free. Like if I, if I think too much, then that's a problem. Um, and that that means the offense is going to win and going to beat me a lot. Uh, and this defense in that second half, they it didn't look like they were thinking too much. They were just flying around and making plays. They kind of figured out and zeroed in on what Utah was, how, how they wanted to attack them. And then they just played free and made plays and played fast. And I was like, finally, finally. So I'm looking forward to what it's going to look like because – Jim Knowles is going to come in and his defense are already known to be fast, play fast and play free and play aggressive. And so once you already have guys that kind of like, oh, it's just look like that. He's already got some film that he can pull and say, listen, like you made the play against Utah like this, I want you to play like this. And then he can bring his own cut ups and show how they should be playing fast and free. And the light bulb should continue to get bigger and bigger for the guys that, that got a lot of playing time and the guys that will be back for the for next season. So it's going to be a lot of fun to watch them. Last thing, just a former player like you, you know, and all you former players, I mean, uh, what, the brotherhood is is pretty stout. I mean, I, that's not saying something that, you know, that's out of uh, out of kilter. I mean, it, I think you guys all just – I've always been impressed by how you guys kind of have each other's back and stuff. And, 
you know, I remember John Hicks and that whole association way back when and stuff and bless his heart, RIP John Hicks, you know, but uh, just, it's amazing. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, uh, when you watch a game like that and you see a guy, you see guys wearing your colors, you know, the colors you wore for a while and, and you gave sweat and blood to, and then they, they get their act together and they figure out a way to win a game in the wildest of fashions. But uh, did, did, do you feel proud? What What is the, you know, we, you, already, you already talked about watching a kid go from uh, first steps to running and stuff, but did the, is there a pride? What, 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 how would you describe what you feel about this, about this group of players here? You know, it's more of a, you feel proud to be associated um, with a, a story program in history that we have. And while, you know, some people call it a down year. I mean, they've had, they won 11 games. They won a Rose Bowl. Like, yeah. yes. Okay. They didn't get a chance to go and compete for the national championship um, the way they wanted to. And sometimes that happens. Like you can't always control everything. Well, I guess you could have controlled that had you taken care of that team up North, but it didn't happen. Yeah. So at least they finally kind of got out of the funk that they were in. Cause that was my biggest fear going into this game was it was going to, they had like this hangover of we were so close. And then you watch that that team didn't play well. You're like, we would have played so much better. And I'm like, ah, like, don't worry about that. Just go and play football. And to see them kind of figure it out and just kind of come back and have a game that had everything you want. I mean, you, they're down, they come back. There's so much drama. There's this, this player gets injured. That player gets injured. This person hadn't played all season and he making these plays. This person is throwing darts out here. And, you know, there's everything going on, all the drama, all the ratings you want. And then you come back, you're like, listen, I'm just glad we won the game and I'm looking forward because that's this is a type of game that can build momentum to really jumpstart a lot of careers um, and let them kind of say, you know what? I did it at the highest level. I got my chance to shine like a, like a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. is like, hey, listen, I caught three touchdown passes. I'm about to build on this and, and keep going. Jackson is going to come in and say, listen, I'm ready to go. Like, look, look what we were able to do against this and CJ. Like, so this is a momentum building game that kind of takes takes and gives you a base to kind of run with. And if you're a coach, Jim knows coming in like, I've got something to work with. Offensive comebacks and we've got some things to work with. And I love it. And I'm just happy that these guys got to play because I've been in those games and I've been in those last second bowl game losses where you're like, oh man, like we had a chance to pull it out, um, but they were able to pull it out and get the victory. And this is a great momentum building for next year. Man, I, I can't let you go because you, I've been sitting here waiting to interject when you, uh, when you got done. You brought up a good point that uh, just – you just said it in conversation there, but watching the team that beat you get gobsmacked by Georgia and you're going, man, you're, you're sitting there as a team and you're going, man, we had the tools to attack this de- defense that Michigan didn't have. We right. didn't take care of business way back when, you know, that, you know, everything's all about attitude and, uh, and confidence and demeanor when you go in to play a football game, just like when you walked into, you know, uh, to the Coliseum as a as a gladiator, you know. And uh, you're right. I mean that that could have had something to do with that start we saw the other night. I, I never, never, you know, I never even thought about that because of course they watched that game, right? Look, you watch the game, you're like, and if <laughs> what could have been, right? Yeah, you, you're, I'm listening to Michigan fans say. Well, it's all about the Big Ten, right? You're rooting for us? No, absolutely not. I'm rooting for you. Like I, I want to see how <laughs> like 50 points. Like I'm gonna be honest. I'm I'm all in on Georgia right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, go dogs. No how about them dogs? Yeah. yeah. You get the Big Ten. Like no, y'all need to lose, and y'all need to lose badly. And then you see it happen, and you're like, man. I mean, we would have been so much. I'm not saying we would have won the game, but it would have been a definitely a definitely a different game, more competitive. Um, on top of that, I think we it would have been interesting to see if we would have been able to figure out some of the things that like we did against Utah that Georgia wasn't able to do to, against our defense because they were going to definitely try yeah. to run the ball and really see what our underneath covers were going to do. So it would have been an interesting game, but I think we would have scored points. And I think we, it would have been yeah. a track meet. And once you get into a track meet, anything happens. Like if it's a shootout, hey, we just need one deflection here, one missed pass here, and off, off to the races. And you, you could you could make it something like, uh-oh, we're on to the next one saying, okay, can we get back to this game and play in Alabama again? But – it's going to be fun. And I, I think you mentioned it earlier. Like I, I mentioned that they were watching, like we should have been there. They didn't take care of business. And I think they now understand like, yeah, just because yeah. you should win a game, everybody's picking you to win a game, like doesn't matter. You got to come and play. And I think that was probably the one of the most disappointing things that I saw 
from watching that game against that team up north was the fact that they wanted it more than we did. Like, yeah. it was almost like we were just kind of like, yeah, you know what? We beat them the last 10 years. Let's flip a switch and we're going to make a play at some time because they always find a way to make a mistake. They didn't. They forced us into mistakes. We made too many mistakes that we couldn't overcome and they ran all over us. And so yeah. it's going to be fun to watch when we play them <laughs> this year because I can guarantee our defense is going to be a lot more aggressive and they're going to be in the backfield and making plays um, and they're going to have to reload because they're losing players. We're losing players, but it's going to be fun to watch, but we've got a good base building off of what we did in our, our win yesterday. And they're kind of coming off the, you know, they're going to have to read all the, all the news clippings. Do they belong? You know, you, you're one and six a, against Ohio state and, and in bowl games, like they're going to have to read all those things. So it's going to either motivate them or they're going to kind of come back and be like, they might, they may start slow. So it'll be interesting to see how it, how it impacts them. But I'm loving, looking forward to what's happened yesterday and what we can build upon with this program. Hey, Marlon Curran, this is Tim May. Thank you for joining my podcast again, man. I know you know who I was. I, I know who I am. I know, I, I know that you know who, that I know who you are. I always screw up the endings here, man. I need to get a, need to get another editor to help me out here, but, Marlon, I appreciate you, man, and we will be in contact. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Appreciate Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Marlon Kerner. Yeah, I told you, man, uh, Marlon Kerner had a lot to say. He observed the offense and the defense, but uh, he, like a lot of people, Austin, they're looking forward to the to the arrival of – well, Jim Knowles is already on the scene, but to what, what, what little changes are going to be made that are going to fix some of the shortcomings of that defense? Because, as Ryan Day said quite clearly – we got to get this defense fixed, you know, after that game the other night. And uh, fixes are on the way. Whether there are going to be other staff changes, they haven't been announced yet Yet as we record this podcast. But you got to figure there may be one or two more coming down the road, right? Yeah, and I, I look at this team, and all you have to do is look at the recruiting rankings to know that there's talent to work with. But, you know, we know um, from the glimpses we got, and we got to see a little bit of practice when we were in California last week, there is a lot to work with here for Jim Knowles and, and however the final uh, staff shakes out his first one running that defense. Um, I, and I think part of this improvement was going to happen naturally. I, I think that sometimes there's been a perception that because Ohio State is so talented that the inexperience shouldn't matter. But there were just, you know, even down the line with somebody who had a big year and led the team in tackles like Ronnie Hickman. He was still doing that for the first time. He still made some mistakes in the Rose Bowl that you can say, um, is this a schematic issue? Is this an inexperience issue? Who, who knows? Uh, not everyone was going to be perfect, and it doesn't happen at the same time, but a lot of them were in this development process, and maybe what Ohio State was doing didn't make a lot of, of sense for the personnel or, or they didn't know how to coach it or, or bring it out properly. I don't know yeah. the answer to that. I defer to – you know, guys like Marlon, I use Zach Bourne every single week um, for phenomenal insight about what's happening there. I just know that they looked at it and um, it wasn't blaming the players for what was happening. And so I only bring that up to say with that inexperienced thing will not be a problem and that a lot of these guys would have just been more comfortable and confident doing anything. If you'd kept the staff in, intact, I think you'd have seen natural improvement. But what you're hoping if, as you're Ryan Day – and you bring in Jim Knowles to oversee that, is that it goes, as you right there, as you did it, is that it goes like that. Because I think it can be. Because now you have a ton of uh, more mature, more experienced guys, whether the scheme changes or not. It's not necessarily about even just having a ton of reps and whatever Jim Knowles wants to run with that 4-2-5, but being on the field and understanding what it takes to compete at that level now. Now you have a lot more people who have done that. And they also will go into this offseason knowing that um, maybe some of the effort and the work they put in and the way they play, well, it, def- it wasn't enough to win a championship. Um, so that'll bring in Mickey Marotti into the equation and, and all this other stuff. But I just look at this team as being loaded for bear to go into next year. And if Jim Knowles has even half of the impact that Ohio State is paying him for, that, that could be more than enough to get the Buckeyes back where they want to be. The analogy is if he has even half the impact Jeff Halfley did, mm-hmm. when after the last time Ohio State won the Rose Bowl and Ryan Day took over as head coach, he brought Jeff Halfley in, 
He only stayed one year before he was named head coach at Boston College. The impact he had was ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, yes. flat ridiculous how much better that defense played the next year. Sometimes you just need a fresh set of eyes, man, uh, and, and thoughts uh, to kind of turn things around and just – you can turn things like Marlon Kerner was talking about. You can just turn things maybe 10 or 12 or 15 degrees this way, you know, uh, uh, from, a, from some things you're teaching or some, uh, some the approach you're having. And it, and it can make the world of difference, you know. It can make the world of difference between, between landing in uh, Honolulu and landing in Fiji, you know. I mean, I was just a little analogy there, the Amelia Earhart analogy. You can also get lost. But uh, I don't see that coming because Jim Knowles clearly – clearly figured out a way to get it done with Oklahoma state as Marlon Kerner and I talked about. And, uh, and you got to figure he's got some plans already. As I said, he probably bit through his cigar sitting there watching that game two or three times the other night in that first half. Cause that's not the way you want it. And you know, let's face it, it looked like they hadn't practiced tackling since August. So right. that's tough. Hey, let's get to my conversation right now with Bill Bender though. Cause he kind of sets the scene Talks about Ohio State and the Rose Bowl a little bit, but sets the scene for the uh, national championship game coming on. And then we're going to come back, and you you and I are going to give a couple of brief, if that's, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, I'm always looking for that, you know, but it never happens because it's you and me. Uh, <laughs> but, a, but a couple of brief predictions on that national championship game. And I welcome back uh, to the Tim May Podcast, an irregular member, so irregular that he's not going to be see, seen on screen today, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, Bill Bender of the Sporting News, welcome back to, to my podcast, my man. Hey, how's it going, Tim? It's going sideways, with, you know, with a slight up and down action, you know, kind of like a, a sine cosine kind of situation. How's it going with you, brother? Oh, well, you know, we got through the playoff weekend, the New Year's Day Six Bulls, and um, – you know, staying busy, getting ready for that trip to Indy that we all dreamed of to watch <laughs> SEC schools play in Georgia and Alabama. I know we all wanted that one. Yeah. I mean, it could have saved everybody a lot of time and money just play it in Atlanta again, right? Like the SEC championship game, part duh. But, uh, you know, it, it kind of went down like, you know, I was hoping it wouldn't go down that way, but it kind of went down the way it was supposed to go down, didn't it, in the playoff semifinals, Bill? Yeah, I mean, Alabama, that wasn't a surprise. It was maybe a little bit of a surprise the way that they did it by just sticking with the running game, uh, letting Brian Robinson rush for 204 yards, daring Cincinnati to, you know, get out of their defense that, you know, kind of focused on Jamison Williams a lot. And then on the other side, um, Georgia was dominant. That, That was clear early. And I think their speed on defense kind of shell-shocked Michigan early. Stetson Bennett had a hot hand. And I think they looked good enough that it caused you to rethink what might happen in Indy when those two teams hook up. Yeah. And it, that is weird, isn't it? Because it's like from one, from one week to the next, you don't know what which Alabama team you're getting, right? I mean, uh, if, if Cincinnati had gotten some business done there early in that game, especially when he had the ball down there with the three chances to score a touchdown and didn't get it done, and who knows how that would have changed things maybe a little bit, maybe not the ultimate outcome, but uh, the final score. But they gave – you got you to gotta say they gave Alabama a much better game than uh, Michigan did Georgia. That was almost stunning the way uh, Georgia uh, made, made Michigan look on offense and defense, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, stunning in some ways, but once they got out to a 14-0 lead, they were able to just tee off on McNamara. I think a couple things happened by design in that game that, you know, late Michigan was playing J.J. McCarthy because I think he may be the answer, a quarterback down the line, if not yeah. next year, because he's a five-star talent. He, he did some things that forced Georgia to stretch their defense a little bit that McNamara didn't, and then – um Georgia just being able to neutralize Ohio State, not Ohio State, Michigan's pass rush with uh, Aiden Hutchinson and Ojabo, they, they didn't get a sack. They didn't get much pressure on Bennett. And, you know, I think Georgia created so many mismatches in Michigan's back seven, but they got to look at it. I, I didn't take much of it. I, I just said that's Michigan's next progression if they want to be a national championship contender is to get a look at the schools that actually can. Yeah, they need to get a little more, a little tougher and more physical, don't they? <laughs> I'm just joking. You know, you remember the Josh Gaddis comments 
<laughs> after uh, <laughs> they beat Ohio State. And wow, be careful what you say. You can come back and kick you right in the butt. And that's exactly what happened with Michigan. Uh, Bill, is uh, two teams from the same conference playing for the championship, does that sully it at all for you? Or are you like me? Do you feel like these probably were the two best teams in the country, all things considered? Well, I mean, they are. And they have been. I mean, Georgia was the best team for most of the regular season. Alabama's been the best team for most of the last 15 years. So, I mean, this is part of it. I mean, you wanted a playoff, and this is how that works, is the when you get into the semifinals, it was two ugly semifinals. I don't know that expanding to eight or 12 would have changed the results much. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, we've, we've got to the point where we've done this playoff thing for eight years, and only six teams have played for the championship in eight years. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that between those two, what, Clemson, LSU, and Oregon and L, uh, uh, and Ohio State. You know, my, yeah. Ohio State, Oregon and Ohio State, and that's it. So yeah. it's a very exclusive group that, that competes for a national championship right now. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, what was your take of the – your impression of the Rose Bowl, obviously talking about that a lot on my podcast this week. I had Marlon, have Marlon Kerner on, former Ohio State football player, just talking about, wow, what, you know, the defense. But then all of a sudden things came right in the second half. And, uh, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba put on a show. So did C.J. Stroud. Shows that have never been seen before in the Rose Bowl in, in, J- in Smith and Jigba's situation. Nobody's ever caught that many yards. Uh, uh passing or had that many yards receiving in a bowl game ever. Uh, just what would you take, man, from, from, from your vantage point? I mean, once they woke up uh, and realized they were there, then it was a game, you know. I yeah. mean, they fell behind early. The defense looked rough in spots. But, uh, you know, a fantastic performance by C.J. Stroud, an fan- even better performance by Jackson Smith Jigba, who – took advantage of the opportunity. I thought Marvin Harrison took advantage of the opportunity. Yes. It's a reminder to people that the Rose Bowl's fantastic. It's it's still my favorite bowl game to watch in a lot of ways, and that proved that. And, um, you know, Ohio State's fine. They're, they're still in that class of teams that can compete for a national championship. They will have to address that defense in the offseason. They've done that with the coordinator. Um the offense is going to be just fine with uh, Stroud and Jigba and that group of receivers and Henderson next year. Yeah, no kidding. And mostly off, a lot of the offensive line back. Hey, last question. Uh, is the postseason alive and well, or are you concerned about the postseason, the way it's set up in major college football now? You know, it's funny because a lot of people were calling that a consolation prize for Ohio State, the Rose Bowl, and yet it probably is going to have a better – a uh, TV ratings number than the two college football playoff semifinals. Uh, uh, you know, the couple of other bowl games were pretty good. Michigan State's comeback win, et cetera. Oklahoma State's comeback win. Uh, I think those were really fun games to watch. I mean, just what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, they were definitely fun games to watch. And I think that you want to get – you can say the easy thing is to say, well, that Ohio State, Utah, that would have been a great quarterfinal or yeah. Michigan State Pitt, maybe Walker and Pickett play in that game. Um, you know, a lot of people complaining about the, the opt-outs and trying to tell kids what they should and shouldn't do. It's their decision. It's always going to be their decision. It didn't hurt Ohio State any. And it was kind of cool that Chris Olave um, played the role of coach. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. So, yeah. I mean, I think the players care – more than people think it's just there it's a business and yeah. um ohio state's part of that big business so i, I don't think many things change um they're going to need to expand it soon be, and i think most of it is the lack of inclusiveness the, the fact that like i just said only six teams have played to this thing hey remember that line from uh john matuzak in uh, north dallas 40 when we call it a game you call it a business when we call it a business, you call it a game. Call it a game. Yeah. I, 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 I've seen that one. It's been a while, Tim. Yeah. I've definitely seen that movie. So, but yeah, never, I mean, to your, you go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. I, I just was going to say that, uh, um, you know, when there's not a lot of inclusiveness in the championship game, it leads to lower ratings. And I, am I excited about Georgia-Alabama? Yes and no. I mean, yes from the standpoint that, 
they were the two best teams. There'll be a ton of talent on the field. It's it's fun from that perspective, but yeah, it's still just become a Southern showcase in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Hey, last thing. Uh, you know, it's my third time I said that, but that's okay, right? With you, you know, you know the drill. But this will be the last thing. Who do you like in that game, man? I picked Alabama, but Georgia kind of changed my mind a little bit. I think this one will be a lot more competitive. Alabama's going to have to find a way to run the football because they won't have John Mechie. They're beat up in the secondary, too. Yeah. I, for Georgia, just Georgia should win on paper, and they should have won the last one on paper, but it's that psychological hurdle that you and I are so familiar with from the Ohio State and Michigan side. Ohio State had a psychological hurdle during the Cooper years. And then Michigan, during the Carr years against Trestle, it was just that they just couldn't beat Ohio State. And I think Georgia's in that right now. Like the last seven meetings, they haven't beat Alabama. They haven't cleared that psychological hurdle. And if they can do that, I think they can leave Indy with a win. Well, Bill Bender, thank you once again for being uh, on the Tim May podcast, the irregular member of the Tim May podcast. And uh, too bad your lovely picture's not on the screen, but, you know, with uh, mine up there, with mine up there, it'll go double. You know what I mean? I think, uh, I think I'll handle uh, the, the Q rating in that regard. But, Bill, thank you once again, my man. Hey, you're better looking than I am anyway. Thanks so much, Tim. Take care, and I'll uh, talk to you soon. Yeah. Even Bill Bender, when he's taking his family on an outing, man, he couldn't be on video there, but uh, he still got on the audio part of it, and I appreciate him. It kind of reminded me when I had Kirk Herbstreit on early, much earlier in the year, and <laughs> he's sitting there in his, his uh, good old golden retriever, Ben, uh, his riding shotgun with him, man. That was still one of my great interviews ever for all kinds of reasons, but, uh, you know, Bill Bender, man, he sets the, set the tone there, you know, and, and I kind of agree with him, Austin. Uh, you still think Alabama's probably the team to beat in this game, just based on the last time these two teams played. It's tough to beat the same team two years in a row. I mean, two, two times in a row, but uh, as we saw when these two teams played two times in what, uh, five weeks, uh, several, a couple, three years ago, but uh what do you think? Did, did Georgia find something or did Georgia just happen to run into a Michigan team that was a, a kind of a finesse, uh, an unphysical kind of Michigan Ooh. team? What Ooh. do you think, Austin? Oh, I mean, Austin? Well, I I don't. You think both, right? <laughs> I'm going to borrow uh, I'm going to borrow one of your old go tos about styles making fights. And, yeah. you know, I think Ohio State was better equipped to play both Alabama and Georgia. Um, than Michigan would have been. And if if some circumstances have been different, I'm not going to rewrite history. We know what happened in the big house. But, um, you know, yeah. Michigan's, Mich- the way Michigan plays, I didn't think was going to be able to match up with that personnel. Um, and so I do think that Georgia benefited from that in a, in a limited – but what Michigan does well was not going to work against Georgia in that defensive line and – they weren't going to get pushed around and dominate with their rushing attack. And why Ohio State wasn't able to recognize and load up the box and make that a more physical game and, and force Michigan to try to win the game through the air, we'll never have a, a clear answer for that. And we'll be talking about it probably for years to come. doesn't matter. But th- that's my point. I didn't think Michigan could win that game, and I, at least not physically. And I didn't think they had the quarterback personnel to challenge it. So, so I do think it is both that this Georgia team got a wake-up call, which is crazy to say that about the SEC championship game. But, you know, there's just the, the human element that they knew they were going to be in the playoff win or lose in that game. Maybe Kirby is a, you know, four-dimensional chess player and didn't want to show a bunch of stuff to Alabama in the first meeting. I, I, I don't usually give him that much credit for that. but I don't either. <laughs> yeah, but, but who yeah, knows? But his name is Kirby Smart. Yeah, he, yeah, that's right. They don't call him Kirby Dumb. Um, I think that Georgia is the better team, and it's it's hard for me to, you know, ever fully get on board with them because they have also have a knack for letting the big one slip away. That's why it's been fifty years since they won a national championship, or forty years, however, forty years, I guess. Um, I'll I'll work on the math for the show in twenty twenty two. That'll be my resolution. that's okay, man. Herschel Walker, uh, go ahead now. Yeah, so <laughs> let everybody else put it together. It's 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 tough for me to, you know, get on board with that just because of the history and, and overcome that. But 
talent has a way of changing history and they're up against a, the genius and a, a dynasty. And we know what happens if you rule out Nick Saban. So I'm, I'm excited to watch it um, much more than I was the SEC championship game. Cause I just didn't think it was going to matter um, really, um, especially once Alabama got the lead in that game. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I know you're excited too. We both get wait all year for it. I'm going to pick Georgia to win. Well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go with Alabama, Alabama only because I think Alabama has a slight edge at quarterback. Although the caveat is if Stetson Daniels plays like he played in the first half against Michigan, if he can play that way all game and not just go off – can't use that term anymore – off the ranch, if he doesn't go off the ranch and just do some stupid stuff like he did in the second half, like he did at the end of the first half against Michigan – uh, Georgia has got a hell of a shot, but I do like Alabama because of Bryce Young. I think they are better at quarterback, and I think in these games it always comes down to that and uh, somebody making a play. Because I think these teams, they're not even by any stretch. I think you're right. Georgia might have just a slight personnel advantage, especially in the trenches. But Bryce Young has shown the ability that when it really gets pushed comes to shove, except in that game against Texas A&M, He's found the ability to pull a play out of his back pocket. And I think that's where the advantage will be. So I'll go with Alabama just so you and I can get on next week and talk about how right I was and how wrong you were. What do you that's think? Right. I want to say, I definitely, I mean, you hit your bold prediction on Saturday in the Rose Bowl. The only thing I would say to that, and part that's of the only one I got right all year, wasn't it? But go ahead. Well, you saved it for a good time, the best time in the postseason. I, go ahead. I, I'm a little. Bryce Young won the Heisman. I don't think that he's even the best Alabama player. I think that guy's playing uh, on defense for well, them. That plays more into my prediction. Well, I know, but my point is this, that putting it on Bryce Young's shoulders, especially um, you know taking Michi out of the equation at receiver, yeah. the Auburn game is in my mind, and he did have that last drive. He would not have won the Heisman if Auburn had simply stayed in bounds. True that. Alabama would be in this game if he – and. And I, Cincinnati in the first half gave him some problems. And I think under pressure, he can do things with his feet and extend it. He just made some decisions that I don't think that's two of the last three games for him where I just – I think there's maybe too much credit given to Bryce Young for what he's proven. And I'm not saying he's bad. Not at all. He's very, very talented, and he's got a great cast of, of weapons around him, even without Mechie. But – um I think Georgia in this game might be able to dial up more pressure and could force some things, uh, force him to do some things that he doesn't like. And that's, uh, I, I don't want to use the term, but I, yeah. I just think Bryce Young gets maybe more credit than he's, he's earned. Well, as that old commercial used to say, Stetson, Stetson fits. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to let you have your say. And then, uh, We'll come back a week from now. This might my podcast might be slightly delayed next week because I definitely want to let that game play out before we talk about that stuff and then moving forward with Ohio State. Right. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, happy New Year! And uh, Austin, once again, thanks for joining me in the co-pilot seat over there, where I let you fly most of the plane. Most of the time, I think people are catching on to that. My little trick there, where I snooze in the captain's seat. You think you're catching up? Hey, we'll keep it going until somebody calls us out. That's right. But when bad weather hits, man, I, I want the controls because I, yeah. be, I want to be the Captain Sully of this thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not Pilot. qualified for that part. Pilot has a plane. Anyway, but until uh, next week, ladies and gentlemen, for Austin Ward, this is Tim May. We will see you then.